Thanks for tuning in to this message. My name is Jared Piney. I'm the online pastor here at Pathway, and I'm here with one of our worship directors and online hosts, Maddie Seitz. We hope this message is a valuable resource to you and helps you grow deeper in your faith. If you consider yourself a Christian and this message blesses you, I hope you'd consider giving back to us at Pathway so we can continue connecting all people to Jesus and helping them become his fully devoted followers. Learn more at pathwaychurch.com forward slash giving. And if you decide to take a step in your faith after the message today, simply visit pathwaychurch.com forward slash next so we can help provide you with resources and partner with you in this journey. Well, welcome, Pathway family, Westlink, Goddard, Valley Center, those of you who are watching online, to this first week of our brand new series, Last Words. You know, the last words that a person speaks are powerful and often really encapsulate really the very essence of their lives. You know, for example, last year was the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, the greatest attack on American soil since Pearl Harbor. Terrorists had hijacked four planes to crash them into the World Trade Center buildings, the Pentagon, and the White House. Flight 93 was intended for the White House, but but it didn't crash there because of the brave passengers who, who fought back to take control of that airplane, but instead it crashed into a Pennsylvania farm field. One of the passengers, right before they intervened, uh, was Todd Beamer. The last words he spoke were actually captured on his final cell phone call to his wife. He said, let's roll. And those were powerful last words. And after that, it was like an entire nation clung to those words because they really summarized really the, uh, all of our American spirit in the midst of that tragedy. And the last words of Jesus, let me tell you, were even more powerful. Because the last words of Jesus didn't just inspire a nation. They inspired and transformed an entire world. And so for the next couple of weeks as we build to Easter, we're going to take a look at some of Jesus' famous last words before he was crucified. Because I believe there is so much that we can learn about the character, the person, and the mission of Jesus that are summarized in his last words that can really change our lives. Now, the last words of Jesus that we're going to focus on today is what uh, he said when he was being crucified by those Roman soldiers. Uh, The place where Jesus was crucified is just outside of the city gate in a place called Golgotha or or Skull Hill. Uh, Many scholars believe it was called Skull Hill because uh, from a distance it looked like a skull. There was a group of Roman soldiers there, and they formed basically a Roman death squad. And they were very proficient at executing people. They knew exactly how to perform their duty. They knew how many nails they needed. They knew how many times they needed to strike those nails. They knew where to position the ropes, and they knew how to put the cross in the ground without ripping the body off of it. So Jesus shows up to Golgotha that day, and he's barely hanging on to his life. He was bleeding profusely. He had a crown of thorns on his head, and his skin was laid bare with all the lashings that he had received. And the scriptures say that the Roman soldiers crucified him. So what was Jesus saying? What was he thinking? What was going through his mind? 
Well, listen to what Luke records in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus says there, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You see, in the last words, uh, he could have easily been angry. Jesus could have easily been angry. He could have easily been screaming out about all the injustice and oppression that the Roman soldiers were, were doing to him, but he didn't do that. Instead, instead, he was forgiving them. You see, those last words of Jesus spoke, they were powerful. They weren't just random words or careless words. That They were words spoken with a purpose, and that purpose was for us to be able to see his heart of grace and to be able to see his heart of forgiveness. Now, to fill in kind of some of the gaps and understand what Jesus is getting at here, I want to tell you a story about my wife, Chris, getting lost. Now, my wife, Chris, has become infamous over the years at getting lost while she's out driving around. And just so you know, I did ask her permission to tell the story. (laughs) Now, several years ago, uh, Chris took a couple of our boys to Kansas City to play in a soccer tournament. She was staying at my sister's house, who lived south of Kansas City at that point in time. And so my sister gave Chris instructions on how to get to the soccer field. Well, this was obviously in the days before kind of Google Maps. And so Chris headed toward Kansas City. And when when she got to I-45, I-435, she made a wrong turn. She went east instead of west on I-435. And she drove and she drove and she drove kind of looking for her exit. And she finally got off the interstate at a place that seemed like it could have been the exit but after she got off the interstate she got so turned around she couldn't find her way back and the more she drove the more disoriented she became and the more panicked and the more frustrated she began to feel and ultimately she got so lost she called my sister and and Chris started kind of reading road signs uh, to my sister Sarah and ultimately they figured out that Chris was somewhere in northwest Missouri (laughs) she got so lost she was in another state Well, Sarah ultimately got Chris back on the right road, and uh, the boys made it to the soccer field that day, but it was kind of like Gilligan's Island. They went on a three-hour tour. (laughs) You see, Chris's problem was she made a wrong turn, and it was the first one. She went east on the intercept when she should have went west. And of course, every turn after that was also wrong, and it served to get her more and more lost. So it was one wrong turn that that put her in a situation, that put her in a place that she was in unfamiliar territory. She didn't know where she was going. She didn't know what she was doing. And she didn't have a road map to be able to help her get unlost. And the reason I tell you that story today is because I think life feels that way a lot of time. Doesn't it? We get in places because we don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're doing. And we get lost. We, we get, uh, we've got parts of our lives like our relationships, our, our money, our careers, maybe even our self-worth where it feels like we made one wrong turn. And, and it might have even been decades ago, but now we're desperately lost. It's like ever since we made that first wrong turn, we can't help but make more wrong turns. And now we've made more doubt, bad decisions. And now we're just lost and we can't find our w- way out. I don't know what that might look like for you. Maybe for you, for an example, you took a wrong turn years ago and you started looking at pornography. You, you kind of did it here and there because it was easier, it was faster, it was less complicated than real intimacy. But then that one wrong turn led to another long term and another long wrong turn. And now years later, you're just trapped in this addiction that you, that you really never wanted for your life. For others of you, maybe some person that they spun you in the wrong direction years ago. Someone you thought you could trust, they hurt you or or they left you. And and it's like in that moment, that person, they they veered you off course and and now you found yourself on this other path. This path of anger. This path of bitterness. this, This path of fear. And that path has led you to all these other wrong turns. You know, for me personally, I had a a traumatic event that happened about 25 years ago when someone close to me lied to me and it caused all kinds of problems. And when that happened, it was something like happened in my heart and my brain and I turned left when I should have turned right. 
And that experience just wrapped its claws around me, and it led me to experience all kinds of depression and, and anxiety. And emotionally, just for a number of years, I just felt lost. I, I was angry. I was hurt. I, I was worried about everything constantly. I felt like I could never make a right turn and, and get things going in the right direction again. You see, all of us make wrong turns. And we get stuck in cycles of sin not knowing what we're doing. And so the question that becomes, when we're lost and we don't know what we're doing, we don't know where we're going, how do we get unlost? Well, the last words of Jesus that he says were, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And those last words were spoken so we can get unlost. And the way that we get unlost is through forgiveness. When we're lost, we don't know what we're doing. The way that we get unlost is through forgiveness. Our road home, when we're lost and we don't know where we're going, is forgiveness. You know, it reminds me of a story in John chapter 8 that's just, to me, an incredible picture of what this looks like. It's a story of the, of the woman caught in adultery. And in John chapter 8, Jesus was in the temple courts. A, a woman who was caught in the act of adultery was brought before him by the Pharisees. And how she got there, we don't know. All we know is she got lost. She didn't know what she was doing. She didn't know where she was going. And now she was in a position where she was going to face some terrible consequences. So in John chapter 8, the Pharisees say to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? So I want you to imagine for a moment how you would feel if you were in this situation. How you would feel if you were just dragged out of the Holiday Inn or wherever that was at down the road and you were dragged in front of this crowd of people that you care about. And they said some very shameful things about you and now everybody's eyes are on you. Everybody's eyes are on you. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that, but if you haven't, I bet just thinking about it, you can imagine how this woman felt. So this woman knows the Mosaic Law, and she knows that she deserves death. But what does Jesus do? Well, let's listen to what the Scriptures go on to say. But Jesus, he bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go and leave your life of sin. So you can see clearly from the story how Jesus reacts. This woman rightfully deserved to die according to the Mosaic law. But Jesus starts writing in the sand and then he says, whoever is without sin can cast the first stone. And everyone in the crowd realized that they can't cast the first stone. So slowly but surely they all walk away. And then Jesus is left all alone with this woman. And you have to understand what happens next in this story. is It's really everything. So instead of condemning this woman, what does Jesus do? He offers her grace. He says, neither do I condemn you. And then he follows it with truth. He says, go and sin no more. You see, when you and I get lost, when we get lost, when Jesus sees you and I, Jesus always leads with grace and then he follows it with truth. He says, I forgive you. You don't know what you're doing. And so many times we assume that God will only forgive us and accept us if we kind of rise up and meet a certain standard. Do you know what that is? When we're doing that, what we're doing is we're behaving religiously. That's religion. And we don't really see that kind of heart at all in the story. We don't see that kind of heart at all. You see, somewhere along the way, you and I, we've created this illusion that if Jesus is real and God is real, he's got to be so mad at us for all the screwing up that we've been doing for so long. And then actually he's in heaven and he's just been waiting for this golden opportunity 
so he can really kind of finally make his point. He can make his point so that we can start getting it right. He, he's like kind of up in heaven. He's got that magnifying glass out, and he's just going to burn us up like a bunch of land. <laughs> and I, I think the reason we, we believe that way, that we think God's going to get us, that he, you know, he's just kind of been waiting all this time so he can get us. And the reason that we believe that and we feel that way towards God is because what? We're that way. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make God into our own image. I know in my parenting many times, boy, I'm going to what? I'm going to lead with the truth. <laughs> and if my kids, if they really respond right and they do everything right, then maybe I'll give them a little bit of grace after that. But man, I'm going I'm to make sure that they get the truth. That's how we are, aren't we? That's how we are. And over the years, I can tell you, even in my prayers, I've discovered that doesn't work so well. But God treats us, what, is, what does he? God treats us far better. And in our story, and really all throughout Scripture, that's what we see. Jesus always leads with grace, and then he follows it with truth. Jesus always creates that safe place for us, that safe place for us to be able to change, and then he gives us the truth. He gives us the road map and that direction that we need in our lives so that we can change our lives and we can get unlost. But he doesn't hold our past, our baggage, our shame, our guilt, our mistakes from 10 years ago against us or for even from today. He, he forgives us and he's graceful to us. And that heart is exactly what we see in Jesus' last words on the cross. Jesus' last words really have so much to say about the kind of God that he is. And that's why it says in Romans 5.8, in fact, but God demonstrates his own love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That means that Jesus chose to be nailed to the cross to demonstrate to us the kind of God that he is and to demonstrate the, how much that he loves us, which is why even while he was hanging on the cross with death right around the corner, Jesus does not condemn he doesn't want to kind of instantly punish us for all the stupid decisions that we've been making all the time that we've ever made. Instead, while he's covered in blood, while he was taking his very last breath, he says, Father, forgive them. He, he starts with grace and then he follows it with truth. So why is all that so important? Well, it's important because if you and I can begin to trust, then we can begin to trust that there's that safe place for us that he Jesus steps in toward us with then maybe that we can trust then his direction for our life the truth that he gives us in our life he creates a safe place for us to begin to change in his grace then he offers us his truth so that we can begin to change our life so how do we then kind of move forward then how do we move forward from not knowing what we're doing and to finding our way home and then experiencing kind of the new life that God has for us well, let me give you a couple of action steps as we think about Jesus' last words. Now, the first one comes in 1 John 1, 8, and 9. And it says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So first, do confess your sins. You know, it's so important that whatever sin problem that, that, that we're struggling with, that we don't bury it, we don't deny it, we don't try to ignore it in some way. We, we need to admit and, and confess it. He's created a safe place for us in his grace so that we can deal with the brokenness and the sin in our lives. So take action and confess your sins. One of the things that I really want to encourage you to do as we approach Easter, I really want to encourage you to do some spiritual spring cleaning, all right? And what I'm talking about when I say that is I'm talking about sitting down with a pencil and paper or maybe with your phone and saying, God, I, I want you to bring to my mind my wrong turns, my sins, and those things in my life where I've made mistakes and blown it. So write those things down. And there, there might not be kind of immediate flood right at first as you're sitting there, but just keep sitting there. And allow God to bring to your mind and to your heart those wrong turns, those sins in your life. 
And if nothing still happens while you're sitting there, I want to let you know you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you're doing it wrong because we've all got stuff. We've all got sins. And I believe that if you'll sit there and allow God's Holy Spirit to speak to you, from, he'll bring to your heart and your mind those places where you're out of alignment with him where you've sinned. But whatever it is, write it down. Quantify it. Lust. Fear. Gossiping, pride, envy, anger, unforgiveness, laziness, our, our addictions. Whatever it is, write it down and, and then confess it to God. And if you have a persistent sin in your life, I want to encourage you to not only confess that to God, but also to confess it to uh, another Christ follower. You know, it says in James 5, 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Confessing our sins to another Christ follower can be a concrete way we can experience really the forgiveness of God. And when we experience his forgiveness, it's so freeing. I mean, it's just like this huge weight is lifted off of our shoulders. We've been carrying it around We've been kind of trying to act like everybody. We don't got any. You know, and I think sometimes, a lot of times, if you've been around church for a while, or probably even just in our natural souls, we kind of want to fake all the time like we don't got any sin, you know? But what happens is when we're denying and ignoring it and everything else, that stuff's piling up. But if you'll confess your sins, all of a sudden, that weight's lifted off of you, that there's a freedom that God wants to give you, and there's just fresh life, I'm telling you, when you write it down, and I try to make it a habit in my life, periodically go through and do that spring clean, write those things down, and be able to, to be able to say, here it is, and to be able to burden my soul and begin to try to live in a different kind of way, but it breathes fresh life into our souls. So no, it makes sense, number one, and number two, God's commanded us to do it because he knows it's going to bring fresh life to our souls if we confess, if we admit our sin to him. And to be able to begin to move in that kind of direction. So do confess your sins. Then the next step is, do receive God's forgiveness. The promise of 1 John 1, 9 is that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So know beyond a, a shadow of a doubt that when you confess your sins to God, he forgives you instantly. And he forgives you completely. He forgives you instantly that he doesn't want you to keep on suffering. I, I mean, I think in our heart and our mind, we think that, you know, we better keep holding on to this to, to, and believing that God isn't forgiving us instantly because we need to keep on suffering for a little while longer. We think, you know, God probably wants us to suffer for a little while longer, but that's not what the scriptures say. Isaiah chapter 55, God is merciful and quick to forgive. He doesn't delay in forgiving you. There's not a waiting period for him forgiving you. No. Scriptures say he forgives you instantly. Not a waiting period. And he also forgives you completely. You, you, you don't have to ask him twice to forgive you, to make sure that it counts. Better, better say it a couple of times. Make sure he knows I really mean business. No. He forgives you completely. Love what it says in Colossians chapter 2. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. You know, all of that reminds me of a man who's been in our Pathway family for a number of years. But back in 2015, he made a number of wrong turns. And his first wrong turn was getting into pornography. He had struggled really with pornography actually for a number of years. He didn't know what he was doing or where he was going. And ultimately he found himself frequenting prostitutes. He told me every time I went to see prostitutes, I don't even know why I was going, but I couldn't stop. And in the process of seeing prostitutes, he started stealing money from his business to fund his addiction. And it wasn't long before his business partners found out and everything came crashing down. In a matter of hours, he lost his job, he lost his wife, and he felt like the whole world was closing in on him. He said that day, 
When everyone found out, everything went black. All I could see was black. All, all I could see was the black of my sin, the black of the horrible betrayal of my wife, and the black that my life was falling apart. He said, I didn't know what to do. I, I felt suicidal. Well, he said, after a few weeks, what changed everything was the grace of God that was extended to him through his wife. He said his wife offered to take out a loan that would enable him to go on a week-long intensive therapy for sex addicts. He said it was a physical manifestation of God's grace through his wife that he began to experience the forgiveness of God in a very real way. He said the other place that he experienced God's grace and his forgiveness was through the men of his sexual addiction support group. They were the other key people that created that safe place so he could feel God's grace, that he could feel uh, God's forgiveness. And, and that pointed him all along the way to the truth and that road to recovery home. He would say that the road home hasn't been easy and it hasn't been short, but God's forgiveness, you see, it was the on-ramp. God's forgiveness was the on-ramp so that he could find his way home. He went on to say that he and his wife are now reconciled and that now they're going to be leaving on a cruise soon where they're going to be celebrating their 31st wedding anniversary. Isn't that awesome? Give God a hand for that. Praise God. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. It's awesome. That's where God's forgiveness wants to take us. That's where God's forgiveness wants to take us. It's that on-ramp so that we can find our way home again uh, to that life that's not only a, a blessing for us, but it's a blessing to other people and ultimately is a blessing to this world. His forgiveness is our on-ramp to home. It's our on-ramp to home. And I want us to, to feel that and to experience that in a real way today. So as we begin to close right now, I just want to ask everyone at all of our locations, those of you who are watching online, uh, just to bow your heads with me, to close your eyes with me, and I want to spend some time praying. So pray with me now. As we begin praying right now, I just want you to quiet your mind. Quiet your spirit. And allow God to bring to your mind and to your spirit those places where you've taken some wrong turns. Those places in your life where you've taken some wrong turns and you need to experience God's grace and his forgiveness. Places in your life where maybe you took a wrong turn and you didn't know what you were doing. You didn't know where you were going. And you sinned. For many of you today, it was maybe something even that's happened in this last week. It was a hurtful word you said. It was an unkind act that you did. Or at least it was something in your heart where you know you sinned against God. I know for others of you today, it's something more significant. I know for some of you today, you're, you're, you're suffering under an immense load of guilt or shame or regret. It's something that's been eating away at you for years. But I want to let you know, whatever it is today, I want you to remember Jesus' last words on the cross. I want you to remember his last words on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Today, Jesus offers you his grace. He offers you his grace. He offers you his forgiveness. So today, if you know, if you know you need God's grace, his forgiveness in a fresh way today, man, I just want you to lift up your hands. I just want you to lift up your hands right now. If you know you need God's grace and his forgiveness in some fresh ways in your life today, I want you to lift up your hands. If you're watching online, you can put me in the chat, but lift up your hands right now all over. If you know you need God's grace, you need his forgiveness in some fresh ways today, praise God. Me too. 
I want God's grace. I want his forgiveness in fresh ways in my life. That I'm free to be able to go serve him and do whatever that he calls me to do. Praise God. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father in heaven, I just thank you so much for your grace. And I thank you so much for your forgiveness. Thank you so much for your grace and your forgiveness. That your forgiveness is instant and your forgiveness is complete. And God, I pray that we would embrace that. We would embrace your grace and your love and your forgiveness, that we take that as an on-ramp, God. We take that as an on-ramp to our way home, Lord. That you pointed us in that direction, God. And you've given us your truth, the truth of your word, to be able to lead us all the way, God. We just thank you so much for that, and we just commit ourselves to that, God. Now, as we continue to pray, I know there's others of you who have never experienced for the very first time, for the very first time, the grace and the forgiveness of God in your life. And I want to let you know, you'll never experience the freedom and the release that your soul longs for until you embrace Jesus. Until you embrace Jesus as the leader and the Savior of your life. So don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment right now. He's been waiting He's been knocking at the door of your heart. He wants to be the leader and the savior of your life for you to experience his grace and his forgiveness today. So don't miss this moment. Don't miss this opportunity. I just want to invite you right now. Take this moment. Invite Jesus in. Pray this prayer with me just in the quietness of your heart. Oh, Lord Jesus, I know that I've made mistakes, that I'm a sinner. But today, Jesus... I open up my heart and I receive your grace and forgiveness. I make you, Jesus, the leader and the savior of my life. And thank you, Jesus, for your grace and your forgiveness that you you showed me on the cross. And now use my life, Jesus, to be able to go and offer that same grace and that same forgiveness to other people. with everybody's head still bowed right now and eyes still closed. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, you made Jesus Christ the leader, the savior of your life, man, I want you to raise up your hands. Raise up your hand right now. Say to God that you're all in, that you received his grace and his forgiveness today. Raise it up real high. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Raise it up real high. Raise it up real high. Say to God, I'm all in. Praise the Lord. I see those hands. Praise God. Praise God. Raise them up. Say, Lord, I see you. I see you. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for those hands. Praise God. He's at work. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you so much today for my friends, brothers, and sisters who became part of your family, who received your grace, who received your forgiveness, God. Pour down upon them, God, just your love, your power, just your presence. God, just enable them, God, through your word to be able to experience just this life that's truly life that you have for every one of us as we follow you. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We thank you that you have been here, you have been here today. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. 